Welcome everybody. My name is Aswin Punatan Baker. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Media Studies at the University of Virginia here. And I wanted to thank you all very much for coming to watch uh, Nasir, a film that was produced by our guest here for this conversation, Madhivan and Rajendra. Welcome, Madhi. Hi, thanks for having me. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, thanks for showing our film. It's a film that, uh, it's, it's been a very, uh, interesting new journey for all of us to be able to make it and in the current time and age it feels like uh, a great film to share with everybody. Absolutely agree and thank you so much for sharing the film with us and for making time for this conversation. Uh, I watched the film recently and it was absorbing I think is the word that I would use. The pacing, the character development was amazing, the performances were brilliant and the final few minutes I suppose the only word to use is deeply unsettling uh, and I'm sure all of our viewers here will also um, leave with uh, lots of questions. And I thought one of the things we could do in this conversation is to just get a feel for uh, your perspective and others that you worked with on the film and give us some more background so we can contextualize the film a little bit for our viewers. Sure, sure. Um, so maybe I can just quickly give you a background uh, in terms of how this film happened. Um, that would be so great. Um, uh, I actually saw Arun Karthik, uh, the director's previous film at Mami, which is the Mumbai uh, Fest Festival in Mumbai. And uh, at the festival, uh, his previous film was playing and then uh, uh, you know, Deepan was playing in the other corner. So it was full. So I just walked across as a Tamil film. What is this? Went there. And then it uh, turns out that this, this film, this Tamil filmmaker, so I mean, it's this, such an interesting, weird film, I must say. And I didn't really understand it. And I thought to myself, okay, there's obviously a lot of interesting work happening, uh, happening out of Tamil Nadu that I'm not aware of. So then I immediately sent a message on Facebook. Um, interesting guy, he immediately said he was going for the strange drive around Coimbatore and he'll be back. And I said, okay, I'll come and meet you there. Drove down seven hours. And then that's when, as soon as I got down to it, I, I, he took me to this little location where he said he was going to shoot. He just dove right into it. And uh, this was like a little ghetto in the middle of Coimbatore. And um, it... it uh, and from there, he just took me on a walk uh, and took me through the entire, all the streets, the entire geography of where several communal uh, issues have sort of happened. And he has a very strong sense of geography. So, and uh, I was able to connect the geography with the violence that emerged. And uh, uh, he told me that he was looking at this particular short story, especially uh, written by a writer by the name of Dilip Kumar. Dilip Kumar in himself, fascinating person. He's a Gujarati, settled in Coimbatore and uh, worked at a, a textile store for about, uh, I think, uh, through his young age. And he wrote a story about a person um, who worked at that uh, particular textile store. So um, Arun's idea was to adapt that story. Uh, and uh, uh, the interesting thing about that short story was that it, it, the entire short story is written in first person in the sense it is you in Tamil saying that you are waking up in the morning, you are, uh, or as in I am waking up in the morning, I am going to get a cup of coffee. So it sort of really gives you that lived experience. So he wanted to try to marry the filmmaking with that. And I think that's sort of uh, what eventually you see on screen. Yeah, thank you for that. That's really helpful because one of the first questions I had for you, uh, both in terms of the setting and the very specific uh, setting within Coimbatore was why Coimbatore? Yeah, right. And Arun is from there. And uh, I think he's always had that uh, uh, idea of making films in and around Coimbatore, about Coimbatore, which is why I said he loves his, the geography. He's always around writing, trying to understand more and more. And I think this was, and this is also an interesting story because, you know, when, with a story like this, you're always wondering where it's coming from. And I think in a, in a certain way, he was also um, affected by the violence that happened there. Um, he, after his first film, decided that he wanted to be a little more entrepreneurial. So he set up a little coffee shop right outside this one locality. And uh, this one day a mob came in and just knocked the entire store off and then walked in. And he thought to himself that if he was going to be in such, um, you know, face, if he was to face such violence, um, uh, he could only imagine what other people were going through. So I think that sort of personal trigger happened and then that he connected that to the short story and then um, uh, it, 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 it worked out. And of course, Coimbatore has had its fair share of riots and uh, communal tensions. Um, and uh, that's probably the reason why. That makes a lot of sense. And it really helps to 
uh, focus viewers' attentions on parts of uh, India with second tier towns, which often get left out of sort of headlines, especially from a Western perspective, where we focus on Mumbai or Delhi. But these small towns, not a small town really, a large city, uh, but a second tier city nonetheless, uh, really helps us put something uh, a life like Nasir's in context, right? And the sari shop was such a brilliant decision uh, because it, the sari shop really pulls together different strands of any city in terms of bringing together communities that may otherwise not come into contact with each other. So could you say a little bit about how your crew thought about the sari shop as a specific kind of space, especially because it brings women from different communities into the shop? Uh, and into contact with a fascinating figure like Nasir. Yeah. So it's a great question because, you know, uh, during the entire location scouting time, uh, Arun kept saying this one thing about the location, which I found very interesting. He's like, I want the store not to be too big. I don't want it to be too small. It is in its own way, holding its own in this big city. And I thought it was a very interesting sort of uh, uh, metaphor for Nasir himself in a way when I think about it, like, it's this little store that's doing well by, by itself. It has the respect of the locals and it's still holding its own. And uh, that was, the, we, we found this one store um, in that lane. And uh, it's also, so we rented out the entire store for about like three, four days as well. And uh, also observing all the things that happened uh, in and around um, actually added to the entire thing. And in fact, the store owner is there in one of the scenes as well. He's the guy who's asking about where to eat in the film. And then uh, he just does a little cameo too. But yes, the store was special. And I, I think uh, I can also sort of focus on the, um, uh, the role of a salesman, right? In, in, in mm -hmm. the story, that daily drudgery that's there, uh, but still you're going through it constantly. And you're pushed in this sort of system where you have to sell and sell. And how you sell is also interesting. And if you notice how the others sell versus how he sells, there's a, there's a, there's a difference. And I thought that, that was also quite fascinating. And uh, Kumaran, the actor, I think, uh, really uh, got that down. There's this particularly lovely moment where Nasir is trying to um, sell saris to a couple of uh, slightly older women who come in. And one of them, he sort of gets into this dialogue, you know, Ninga Partia, like, are you a grandmother? Uh, yeah. And he sort of goes on on that thread. And it really suggests the kind of way in which Nasir is embedded and has connections to different uh, sections of uh, Coimbatore uh, and he's able to sort of hit it off with a range of people, uh, the kinds of relationships he has with across a cross section of people he encounters in the sari shop was all beautifully brought out I thought yeah. uh, and uh, I think perhaps it came through the short story as well and the fact that uh, Arun Karthik is very much a Coimbatore person. True, true. And I think here another interesting, just to speak about the actor himself, uh, Kumaran Valavan, uh, again, very interesting guy. And actually, maybe I should just pause for a second to talk about what Dilukuma said about the story, which I still think holds true today. Uh, Dilukuma said that, you know, has his thought, his, sort of his idea that, you know, every story is like, uh, has a life and it like sort of attracts people constantly, right? And then slowly it forms itself. So when you're trying to push too hard in an opposite direction, it just doesn't work, right? So I think that the soul of the story was a, it was a short story which attracted Arun, which attracted probably me to drive down, which attracted Kumaran to come in also. So, and finally, all of us to speak today. So there's that energy that constantly attracts and sometimes it's good to sort of let it go and then uh, find that uh, space. Uh, and specifically with respect to the actor, because Kumaran is, uh, he's a physicist, I believe, uh, and uh, a professor in France. He's a Ta Tamil French uh, person who lives in Pondicherry, a very renowned theater uh, director who does uh, shows all over, I mean, in France, and uh, with this company called Indian Ostrom. And uh, yeah, and uh, he, so uh, I knew Kumaran from my theater days, and Arun suddenly sends me this little photograph uh, saying that, hey, would he be good for uh, Anasir? I said, I know him so well. So let's just drove down and met him. And uh, this is another thing that we think that sometimes the actors themselves, they, uh, if they are like that, they don't have to do much. Like that, Kumran is like a Nasir in a way. Like he's, yeah. that's what he embodies. Yeah. So speaking of Nasir a little bit more and Kumran and his poetry and his theater background and so on, one of the things that struck me the most about the way the, uh, like you said space was crucial, right? Geography was crucial. So I want to uh, ask you a little bit about the soundscape, the sound design. I found it really striking that 
the sounds of violence that we hear, the sounds of right-wing Hindu nationalism, we never put a face to it. There are um, slogans being shouted. Uh, we hear sounds of uh, violent messages being spoken during a rally, like on loudspeakers in the city itself. Uh, but when it comes to the various protagonists, we hear poetry. We hear lovely poetry about the rhythms of daily life. And that was the one thing I wanted to ask about because given that you built this lovely um, soundscape around Nasir's life, especially the opening Azan and so on, this was a bit jarring. So I was wondering if you could say a little bit more about why you chose not to make the, uh, not to give the right-wing forces uh, a bit more of a space within the story. So I think probably, uh, I, I guess I can speak a little bit as at least a collective of what we've had thoughts, probably not as what Arun intended it to be, um, because he might have a more clearer perspective on that. I think from the beginning, uh, uh, the intention was to not, like the mob doesn't have a face, right? And I think that's sort of, um, even for me, when you know, getting into the film, I was always thinking like, it becomes almost uh, propaganda-like when you give it a face. So I, I like the fact the mob, even at the end, the last scene, the mob doesn't have a face. And what's interesting about all of the recordings is that they were all live. They, none of them were manufactured, right? Mm -hmm. So they were all from that space. So there's a certain truth, I think, that emerges in being able to collect the sounds from that space and then present it in the film uh, without actually having a face, saying that you are going about your life every day while this is always there to haunt you. So that is sort of, I think, probably uh, how, how I would see it. I think that makes a lot of sense, especially because it's that sudden eruption of something violent into the ordinary that transforms life. And in this case, uh, really puts an end to something, right? Uh, because there's one amazing scene where Nasir is in the sari shop. The owner comes in asking about where to go have lunch and so on. And the sari shop, uh, the guy on the phone gets into this lengthy sort of dialogue, but he also has some pretty... Um, horrifying things to say about uh, religious identity and so on. And so it's that sudden emergence of some small statement that plants a seed in the viewer's minds as you're watching and building up to the final moment. But even that is a shock. Uh, there is simply no getting away from it. I think the, um, uh, you know, in one of the discussions that I have, uh, that came up with, there's a discussion around what is uh, you know, what, what is the worst kind of violence? And the worst kind of violence is the ones that are sudden. It just takes it and it's gone. And uh, that's it. Everything that you know is just taken away from you in a single instant. And that's a different kind of violence that, uh, you know, we do, uh, that I think I wanted to present. Yeah, and it, 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 I think the effect of it really stays with you um, for a long time, in part because we simply don't know how dramatic and how horrifying the effects of this are on Nasir's life and family. Right? We also get this lovely portrait of his family as not a traditional sort of patriarchal, his wife, uh, he's caring for um, a son who has uh, all kinds of challenges um, uh, in his life. And it's this lovely portrait of him uh, trying to figure out what to do next. And that is snuffed out. And it really does stay with stay with the viewer yeah true, true. yeah so if we could shift gears a little bit um, if you don't mind and talk about how you might situate this film within the context of uh, Tamar cinema right now uh, and in one of the interviews I read that you gave you said one of the challenges is to the Indian context given that there is no viable or there is no thriving parallel cinema movement so yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about what indie means to you at this point in time? Yeah, sure. I think indie in the in, in like how it. I mean, I guess in the U.S. it's largely making it outside of the large studios, but I think here it is just making a film which is outside of a known system, right? And I think uh, in different ways we are trying to be truly independent in the sense that the film was not made with the intention to sell it to a Netflix or an Amazon. It was not made with the intention to sell it to. Um, you know, to have a theatrical in a certain territory. It was with the possibility that anything could happen, right? And that's when we felt truly independent. And similarly, in terms of the financing, uh, partially funded from, uh, you know, from the Netherlands and also from uh, some great producers, co-producers from 
uh, India as well. Um, I think having all of them made us think independently in terms of what all we could do. So for example, experiment with a VR1 festival, you know, and just have it out for a single day, right? It's unheard of sort of thing, of course, COVID, but still one day screening digitally across the world. But it was so powerful suddenly because 61,000 people who watched the film connected by that voice on that one day were able to voice something out in digital, uh, you know, and it amplified could never have happened that easily otherwise. So I think being independent in that sense, that's what independent would mean for, uh, for me personally, is being independent of any system and being able to take advantage of all of the steps from there. In the context of Tamil cinema, uh, I think, I mean, of course, we all have very love-hate relationships with, uh, you know, the cinema that we are uh, in. But uh, I think right now I do have only love in the sense that it's a, it's a state where, the, you know, people are always thinking living cinema that uh, while it is a challenge and you do present something well, the audience does eventually, you know, uh, take to it. So in that context, I think independent uh, cinema, we have to find better ways of distribution, I guess. That's what I'm really constantly you know, thinking about constantly. How do we find more, you know, assured distributors that, you know, they can uh, want to uh, pick up uh, films like this. And uh, it's also interesting because even though it's a state, like whatever, we I mean 75 million, etc. I mean, it is 75 million and we do have a set of diverse voices. You have a voice like Vatri Maran, you have uh, commercial voices like, you know, now it's Sudha Kongara. And it's, it's, it's interesting that the diversity brings even in commercial cinema. Um, Ram, there's so many of them. So we've always had that and that's great. Um, and I think Arun, uh, uh, another director we work with, Vijay Jepal, another one, Balaji Vembu, um, I mean, even the commercials, Mari Salvaraj, everybody, we're all bringing in new, new voices now. Uh, and uh, it's, I think, and it's probably going to be a more explosive time for Tamil films. And your own background, so given the fact that you've worked for so long in theater, and one particularly fascinating uh, stint in the digital world with YouTube, with uh, Rascalas, um, could you speak a little bit about how theater and digital comes together for you in interesting ways, both in terms of a producer, but also thinking creatively about audiences, thinking about distribution and so on? I, I think uh, independent cinema is that soft spot between theater and uh, digital, because theater, mm -hmm. it's even if there's three people there, you just have to go out and give out the best thing you ever see out there. So you're used to not really having an audience and try really concentrating on the truth of what you're trying to say. And then you're always thinking about craft, which is great. And it's a very community thing, right? At the end of the day. Digital, on the other hand, is mass. as, And that's why after a point, I couldn't hold out because, you know, it was about, like, how can you get a million views? Then you start stooping towards decisions. And I have to make decisions, which, which probably I may not have done in higher, you know, shouldn't have maybe, uh, in just trying to get an extra view. Now, independent cinema is like at the cusp. So it's creative. It's about community. It's also about trying to understand how to get to those million people without having to get to a million. So I think uh, all of these have informed each other a lot. Uh, and um, the entire digital space has just at least opened my eyes a lot more in terms of marketing and understanding the end user a lot more and uh, trying to craft uh, uh, stories uh, to the, I mean, uh, I like to think of it as story of the story to the audience sometimes, right? because I think that's also important and just left to itself, it takes a lot longer uh, for it to actually reach people. I think that these are two places that it's benefited me a fair bit. <coughs> so, so to, to wrap this up, I did want to uh, think a little bit more about um, what a film like Nasir means in this particular context we're living through, uh, given the way in which we have seen even digital spaces, despite their promise of being uh, a more democratic space, uh, has been taken over by state forces, by market forces in very, um, uh, in, in very direct ways, both in the US context where uh, we're screening your film now and as well as in the Indian context. So it seems to me that getting a film like Nasir out and circulating in these spaces is whether we want it to be that way or not, um, is a really important political and cultural statement. Um, so is there something that you would like to say that your crew has talked about perhaps about making a film like this in the current historical moment, the moment in which we, there is a sense of desperation about where is the space for other ways of imagining a future? 
That's a, a wonderful question. I really wish Arun was there to answer it. Uh, because I think speaking about the film's craft might not be right for me, for my hand, but I think maybe in terms of uh, collectively, um, mm -hmm. I think reflecting on Nasir again, through its making, finally presenting itself, there is a certain gentleness to the protest, yeah. if you will. And I think that's really important. And it's there's a lot of love and tenderness in that. And I think that's what uh, can make a difference probably. Otherwise, we are not creating spaces where uh, we can meet at all, right? Otherwise, it is just we're just living in two different bubbles. So I'm hoping that uh, uh, the tenderness and the gentleness of this film uh, allows for people to kind of reflect on uh, uh, these decisions, I mean, the, the, where we are as a world today. And uh, truly, the thing that keeps ringing my head, and uh, when Arun said it once, and I can, the final scene that the mob doesn't have a face, right? And it is, it is not just one person, it's a mob. And it could be a digital mob. It could be, we see, we are seeing digital lynchings and cancel culture today, which is all, uh, you know, uh, uh, stemming from this. And uh, this is truly, I mean, we are, we may not be too far to say that we are at a very interesting point in history because of the level of, you know, how digital and, um, you, know, co you know, digital corporates and cinema, everything is converging. So uh, hopefully the makers will we'll continue to sort of uh, challenge this, this the hierarchy of cinema that we see continuously. Thank you so much, Madhi, for that last comment about um, the fact that Nasir is, at the end of the day, one of the most gentle protagonists we can imagine. And his way of moving through the world with tenderness and with poetry is such a wonderful way for us to um, think about him, remember his uh, presence, and hopefully have that carry over into our worlds today, different worlds in many other, many, many parts of the world. So thank you so much for taking the time uh, for all your uh, really thought provoking answers. And um, we hope that this film does really well in the future as it moves through the world. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much for your time, Aswin.